and so the first speaker is uh, Josef Teichmann uh, from Etihad Zurich, uh, who will be speaking on semi martingale signatures. Okay, over you, to you, Josef. Thank you, thank you, Lane. Let me let me try if the technology works. You can see everything, Lane. Uh, yes, it's visible. Yeah. I can see the mark you've made on the screen as well. Yes, very good. So welcome everybody again from my kitchen today. It's first snow in Zürich. And I was dreaming for a moment of being in beautiful Rio de Janeiro at this wonderful conference, uh, researching options and uh, meeting all the friends at the beach and uh, having a warm, uh, short uh, holiday uh, uh, at the end of November. But this year is different and therefore we are all at home, but we still meet and continue doing uh, uh, our uh, scientific research and exchange our ideas. Uh, my talk is about semi-martingale signature and I deliberately write signatures uh, because I will introduce uh, several or whole families of different type of signatures. Uh, signature is a concept from a rough path theory and actually going further back uh, in algebraic topology. These are, uh, simply speaking, um, regression bases on path space on which a large amount of path space functioners can be regressed. So you have uh, uh, linear combinations of signature components and those components then are spanning a large, a high dimensional, a large a class of uh, functioners on path space. And therefore they are of course interesting in uh, mathematical finance since not only are payoffs or filters or estimators uh, uh, path space uh, functioners, but also sometimes uh, strategies uh, controls uh, in certain uh, areas appear to be best parameterized as uh, path-based functioners in a generic form. So let me first uh, introduce uh, these uh, regression bases first on a simple example, which is actually the example of classical geometric graph path theory. Then I will introduce the one which is announced in in the title, this is for semi-martingales. Uh, this is in spirit different from rough path theory, so we do neither need the rough integration for that, nor do we go a stone Weierstrass uh, inspired uh, path in order to show uh, density in a class of uh, path-based functioners, but we rather work with uh, classical semi-martingale um, approaches here. And then I show something important uh, from the point of view of application that actually there are low dimensional tractable replica of those uh, uh, regression bases. So this means for certain tasks you can construct uh, linear combinations over those uh, regression bases or actually not even linear combinations but uh, uh, other regression bases which are considerably lower dimensional but approximately can do the same job as the previously constructed regression basis. That's an interesting phenomenon by itself. In machine learning, this has uh, to do with uh, fields called extreme learning or reservoir computing. And uh, I will comment a little bit on that. But step by step. So first, in order to show us an introduction, um, what the signature of a, of, a, of a geometric rough path is, I take, uh, put myself into a simple situation. I have a state space uh, E here. I have an initial value Y. I have vector fields VI. So these are just maps from the state space to a tangent object of the state space. And uh, let's assume just for 
the sake of this talk that I actually have d vector fields and I have a so-called control u. So this is nothing else than a curve from R to Rd. And uh, I do not need more, therefore I take it actually C1 here. So I have a once continuously differentiable curve and I look at this non-autonomous differential equation, which I call controlled ordinary differential equation. And the uh, uh, differential equation can be described like that. The speed of the particle whose uh, uh, space point in state space E is yt. The speed of this particle is a linear combination of uh, vector fields vi, where the coefficients are just the derivatives of uh, ui. This is the ith component of the control u. And we are uh, calling this equation a controlled ordinary differential equation. And actually, we are interested in the map from the control to the solution curve of this equation. So one should rather make a point here. Actually, we consider the control as a curve and we also consider the outcome as a curve. We are interested in this map and there might from time to time also be a linear map on state space, if state space is a linear space, mapping this to another uh, linear space. So we're interested in describing such maps in terms of U. And when you discretize this system, so you discretize, let's say, with the Euler scheme, uh, this uh, non-autonomous ordinary differential equation, this controlled ordinary differential equation, you could have in this case models of uh, recurrent neural network LSTMs. So this is actually a continuous time version of very well known objects in machine learning. And we would like to understand actually the nature of this map and to work so with this uh, theoretical insight here. So as I said, I'm interested in understanding for such a type of ordinary differential equation a map from the input control to the solution. Everybody knows if you use a Brownian motion, if you use a C1 curve, it is a, C, a continuous semi-martingular rough path, the map from U to Y, and also in the case of a C1 control, this is a complicated non-linear map where you actually have a loss of uh, derivative. So in order to control the the, the infinity norm of y, you need to know something about the C1 norm of u. This is by the very nature that you have a non-linearity, but also a non-continuity with respect to the uniform topology. So therefore, it is in many respects a complicated map, which one tries to understand. And let me allow you now to introduce uh, uh, a tail expansion for this type of map, a tail expansion uh, which is known in the field of uh, deterministic control since uh, certainly more than 50 years, but as well as I mentioned before, in algebraic topology and in other fields. And it's easily written down with the notion of a so called transport operator. So V is a test function. And if I apply a vector field on the test function, I do it in a way that I take the direction or derivative of the test function in direction of the vector field V. And this is then a first order differential operator if you consider it as a map from test functions to test functions. And this is called the transport operator. And of course, this is characterizing all tangent directions of, um, of the state space E. And given this definition, one can write down the following equation. So instead of the y t, I write here a word in order to uh, represent the fact that it is a non-autonomous equation. So this is the same equation as before, written as Evol, and I would like to know what happens if I apply a test function to the solution of this differential equation. And the Taylor theorem tells you can write this as a sum over degrees k, the k governs the lengths here, and here actually it should be an i k, I'm sorry, um, it governs the lengths here of this, uh, of this iterated integral. You have here iterated integrals integrated over this uh, simplex type guy, and as a factor before you have a number, and the number is the 
iterative application of the transport vector field on F, this is a function and another transport vector field and so on. So this is a K for derivative which you apply in F. And uh, the, 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 the exciting bit of this, uh, of this formula is the following thing. This guy here only depends on the particularities of the dynamics. This means on the vector fields. And this guy here only depends on the particularities of the control. And actually, this is bilinear in those two uh, slots. So you have some, you have split the effect of the vector fields and the effect of the controls into this uh, long sum. Now, if you put that into a more algebraic term, of course, you can write down a, a, a remainder term and everybody in the audience could immediately write the proof for that. The proof is just write what happens if you take a test function applied on the solution of an ordinary differential equation. You take the fundamental theorem of calculus, you get initial value, insert it into the test function plus an integral, and then you have the transport vector fields applied to the test function, integrated along the solution trajectory of the system, and you have a test function on the right-hand side. You insert the formula into itself and you iterate this procedure. Very simple, inserting a function into itself, sort of uh, fixed point iteration, and when you do that, you get precisely this uh, expansion here, and you get also this remainder term. So easy piece of algebra. Going back to Chen in the 50s, Benarus in the 80s was working on this uh, uh, when he worked on hyperelliptic diffusions, and of course Terry Lyons took it as a starting point for rough path analysis. And to put this into an algebraic setting, you don't need to look at the big words here, Hopf algebra. Um, even though I like uh, the word Hopf algebra because it was developed by Heinz Hopf, who was a uh, ETH professor, and I'm working in the same building where he was developing uh, uh, those ideas. So the only thing I need here is that actually, if I take D, non-commutative variables and I look at all possible monomials, they are non-commutative and free and you consider them as uh, monomials, you write power series in non-commutative indeterminates and you consider formally converging power series, then you have the so-called Hopf algebra of former series. I don't tell you why it is in Hopf algebra, that, but I just tell you that it is one. And on this Hopf algebra, you can consider linear maps. This is multiply a former power series from the right with one of these indeterminates and rising all um, degrees of the monomials actually by one by multiplying it from the right with EI. It's a very clear operation you can perform on this algebra. Then you look at the following linear, non-autonomous, controlled, ordinary differential equation acting or living in this algebra. And this linear, non-autonomous uh, equation can be solved. And the solution of this equation actually is the collection of it, all iterated integrals, precisely the, uh, the bits which I had before in this uh, Taylor expansion. And this gives me now an interpretation of the iterated integrals not only as something which uh, which is the basis for those uh, um, um, expansion before, but it is also the solution of a dynamical system itself. So iterated integrals appear as a solution of a dynamical system. This is of course not a very deep statement. Deep things would come afterwards, but it is a use, useful statement. It says that precisely the basis which I had before, this uh, vector of all iterated integrals, this can be written when you take them as coefficients of a former power series as a solution of a dynamical system. The pi m just says I take the solution of the dynamical system up to order m. Then I apply a linear map on this high dimensional space. The linear map are just the coefficients which I calculated before. So the vector fields uh, operating in different orders on F. And if I take that, then I get exactly the solution of the equation inserted into the test function plus this order term. So in that sense, you can write 
what happens if you apply a test function on the solution of a differential equation as a linear map which only depends on the characteristics and as a universal object which only depends on you. In the sense of machine learning, you would say you have written a regression basis for solution trajectories of generic dynamical systems where the regression coefficients depend on the particularities of the system and otherwise the regression basis is universal in uh, just depending on the U. And this gives you a, a, a first uh, 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 example of signature. Signature is the collection of all iterated integrals, and all iterated integrals here provide you with a regression basis of generic solutions of differential equations. And we think a tiny little bit more about this you would very quickly see that if you multiply two uh, components of this big signature vector with itself at the same time, then you actually can write that as a linear combination of other components of signature. So this means that the components of signature themselves, if you take the linear span of them, they form an algebra and therefore you can make a stone weierstrass argument and uh, get the density in a certain set of uh, functionals. And this is, of course, an important theory, and this theory is very much used uh, in rough analysis. Uh, this was the simplest part. This is so-called geometric rough paths, but you can also do it with so-called branched rough paths, which have been introduced by Massimiliano Guminelli uh, more than 15 years ago. This is used by the Oxford group like around uh, Terry Lyons and also Harald Oberhauser, who do provable machine learning on pathways with those uh, signature bases. This is used in banks, JP Morgan, for instance, where uh, non-parametric pricing and hedging of exotic derivatives, which are path space uh, functions, which you now can approximate by signature, where this is used. And the only thing which is a little bit annoying about signature is that besides its beautiful properties, it remains to be an infinite dimensional object. And in contrast to many applications in machine learning where one has relatively low dimensional feature extracting maps, it is a very high dimensional, in that sense, even infinite dimensional. Uh, object and it's a well defined object, so it does not have any sort of random feature, uh, which as often in machine learning you find. And therefore, a question you could ask at this point is the following Is it possible to find lower dimensional random objects with similar properties to signature? In other words, can you find a basis? on path space, which is lower dimensional, means finite dimensional, since signature is an infinite dimensional, an infinite basis on path space, which has, for certain tasks, similar properties than signature in terms of approximating um, 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 nonlinear maps. And the second thing uh, I asked, and I don't ask it on the page, but I just go directly to the theory of that, is whether one can do this uh, analysis, which I did before, also for processes or for trajectories where you have jumps. Because what I had before was explicitly not having a jump structure because I have a first order calculus there and this first order calculus is actually an important part of that uh, theory. So when you look at the, a good part of rough path theory, you will always see rough paths are continuous curves uh, with of course a very low path regularity. Going into a non-continuous, a cut-like direction is actually something which is only recently uh, done. David Prömer, Terry Lyons, Peter Fritz, uh, John Liu, one of my former PhD students, are working on that. But this is uh, not an easy endeavor. And I want to show here one stochastic alternative uh, to this approach, or rather complementing this approach, and this is going in the following, this is signature for semi martingales So I do a similar construction than before, but I do it actually for semi martingales Let me just give you a two-minute simple introduction to uh, 
Simi martingale analysis, this is all actually I need here from Simi martingales. So we have three spaces here. We have the space of simple predictable processes. This is clearly a piecewise constant and the height of, uh, of um, um, this uh, uh, piece by constant piece is actually measurable with respect to the left endpoint, which is a, a stopping time with respect to the given filtration. So HI is FTI uh, measurable. So these are simple predictable processes. Then we have the left limit right continuous processes cat lat and we have the right limit left continuous processes cat lag l and d on those processes you have a topology the topology is actually relatively simple it is the uniform topology on compacts in time and convergence in probability with respect to the probability space the so-called ucp topology and it is an exercise you can give your students uh, your maybe advanced students uh, in some point in their master studies that these are actually complete topological vector spaces with respect to this topology L, D and of course not the simple predictable ones but they are dense in L or uh, dense in L as I have defined them. Okay, what is a good integrator? A good integrator is a map which is continuous with respect to these uh, UCP topologies defined by means of a process X, such that uh, this mimics precisely integrating a piecewise constant integrand. And this is what we expect the piecewise integrand to be integrated to. And we say X is a good integrator if this map is continuous with respect to the UCP topology. So if the piecewise constant map is on running on a finite finite grid, you still have a continuity with respect to the UCP topology here and here. And the miraculous beautiful theorem, which actually has an elementary uh, but uh, uh, and beautiful proof is the Bichtele de la Chérie theorem telling X is a good integrator if and only if it is a sum of a local martingale and the process of finite total variation. Both directions are non-trivial. It is not trivial that the local martingale is a good integrator. And it is, of course, not trivial that the good integrator is a semi-martingale. The only thing which is relatively easy to see is that the finite variation process is a good integrator because it is just a process where you can integrate everything and in particular also uh, a simple predictable processes. Now, one could introduce the MRE topology. I don't do that here. The, I introduce good integrator because I want to write the ITO formula. Good integrators allow to integrate left continuous uh, processes. And this is actually what I need in order to write down the ITO formula. And everybody in the audience knows the ITO formula. You have a C2 test function applied to a vector of semi martingales. Then you have the first order part the second order part integrated with respect to quadratic covariation. And then you have this beautiful jump uh, sum, which is going over all possible jumps of this uh, guy. And you see here, this is by no means the first order calculus and even the Stratonovich version is not a first order calculus, but it allows relatively easily to make a similar construction as in the case of signature. And this is what I want to do in the following thing. And uh, the following little theorem, I take x1 up to xn good integrators, so semi-martingales and also the quadratic. Uh, uh, so they are all defined on the same uh, probability space. You have quadratic covariations and you have also uh, jumps possible. So general good integrators, no further integrability conditions. And these good integrators, I consider again an algebra as before, but the algebra has a larger set of generators. I have E0, this will correspond later to time. I have the EIs, they correspond to X1 up to Xn. I have EIJs, they correspond actually to the quadratic covariation, since quadratic covariation is symmetric, I only need it for I less or equal than J. I have EIJK, this will correspond to the jumps of i, j, and k multiplied uh, with each other and higher terms. So these correspond to jumps. And I consider the following doubly infinite, uh, or the following equation, 
So this is a controlled differential equation where you have dt, dxi, where you have uh, quadratic uh, covariations and these products of jumps. So in terms of a controlled ordinary differential equation, you have an infinitely long control vector here, and even a stochastic one. And uh, this control vector, you can ask whether you have a solution there. And but by the same uh, 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 properties as before, the solution will be the collection of all iterated integrals of those of different components of this uh, vector of controls. If this vector is infinitely long or not, does not matter at this point. And you can prove actually that you have existence and uniqueness for this equation. And the solution is just a collection of all iterated integrals. Now, yeah, and the beautiful theorem is then the following. Actually, these guys, if you take linear combinations of semi-martingale signature, they form an algebra. And this algebra is dense in the closure of all polynomials of these guys stopped at deterministic times. So actually, if you take polynomials of x1 up to xn and iterated integrals and so on, you obtain a large class of semi-martingales. And what you have constructed here is a, a regression basis of semi-martingales for this large class. So these are actually all semi-martingales you can write in the own filtration of the semi-martingale x up to an additional condition and which have the jumps at the same points where the original semi-martingales has the jump. Okay. This is in one sense, in a path-dependent sense, a statement which is can be compared to a predictable Martingale representation property. In some sense, this can be compared to that because here you might recognize as of terms which appear in this uh, uh, integrals with respect to the jump part. Okay, and in the last uh, three minutes now, I do not go into the proof of that lemma. I just want to ask uh, to give me uh, three uh, minutes or three uh, minutes again of attention. I would like to introduce a concept which is called the uh, johnson lindenstrauss compression of information. So you have now this basis, this infinite dimensional basis, which is a regression basis for path space functionals. And you would like to construct a finite dimensional replica of it. And since we understand in both cases, the first case and the, so the Cindy Martingale case, that you actually have a dynamical system driven by a control, one can ask whether one can project this dynamical system to a lower dimensional space with this johnson lindenstrauss technology, obtain a dynamical system there, and this dynamical system is in a way close to the original system. And this works by this uh, following beautiful lemma, the johnson lindenstrauss lemma from the 80s characterizing some properties of uh, Hilbert spaces, if you formulate it uh, um, um, uh, correctly. So you have an endpoint set Q in the scalar product space, and you ask to which low dimensional space RK you can map the endpoint set such that the distances are only changed up to epsilon, and epsilon is a given number. So this is called an epsilon distortion. It is the question, can you find an almost isometric map from an endpoint set into a low uh, dimensional space? And this is, of course, an important uh, construction because if this is true, you can embed a point cloud in a high dimensional space, actually in a low dimensional space without changing the geometry of the cloud. And the fascinating thing is that actually you can find a logarithm in n-dimensional space to do the job. Epsilon goes in the denominator, this is clear, but still a logarithm of n. So in other words, and this should uh, demonstrate the fascinating contents of this theorem, in a k-dimensional space you can find exponential k almost orthogonal vectors. 
what is not what you tell your kids when they go to sleep, how they should imagine high dimensional spaces that you can find in a k dimensional space e to the power k almost orthogonal vectors. But this is effect, effect of concentration of measure, effect of high dimensional uh, geometry. And we use this in order to construct so called randomized signature. This is a theorem which we have been proving. Krista Kukiero, Lukas Gonon, Ludmila Grigorieva from Constance, uh, Juan Pablo Ortega from St. Gallen, and myself. Taking such a Johnson Linden Strauss map, one can actually uh, find a dynamical system on a low dimensional space which actually has almost the same properties than. Uh, signature on high dimensional space. This works for signature, this works also for semi-Martingale signature. One needs several aspects of uh, a convex analysis there and I don't go into detail uh, how to do that. I just say at the end what is the outcome of this statement just in case of such a, a unknown dynamics. Imagine you have such a dynamics which is given to you, you know you and you know a solution, but you only know the solution along one control U. And the question is, can you reconstruct uh, the dynamics for another control U by just having this bit of information? And the previously uh, stated theorem says, yes, you can do that, just uh, solve this uh, random dynamical system, which is the johnson linden strauss projected signature system on the low dimensional space. So this is a random matrix A applied to Z plus beta a random bias. I forgot to make the brackets here, so let me write it like that. Solve this equation and then make a regression of the known Y via W on the solution of this guy here, and this regression actually provably uh, should work out up to a certain degree of accuracy. And this, uh, it would work out if you take full signature, but it also works out with high probability if you take this low dimensional replica. Similar construction works if you do um, this uh, uh, with uh, semi martingales with jumps, even though there you have to make a little bit more complicated uh, uh, random matrix construction. And this would then be a randomized semi martingale signature. And just to give you a little bit of fantasy how uh, examples in finance could look like, one example is, for instance, that you imagine you would like to learn the dynamics of S&P 500. If you assume that the dynamics of S&P 500 is given by such a type of equation, by a diffusion with some uh, Brownian motions and some unknown, of course, uh, vector fields, then you can do some uh, analysis that this should be free of arbitrage and therefore should be a market price of risk and so on. So you can write it actually in the following way. You have some Brownian motions with drift, actually with a time dependent and stochastic drift, and you have some VIs here, uh, vector fields which you don't know. And there is of course a procedure how to get trajectories of these guys out from the trajectories of Y. Some people call it construction of the market Brownian motion in econometrics. It would just be called a local uh, decorrelation uh, uh, of the uh, and normalization of the returns of the market. And then you can ask whether you can learn the map from M to Y. These are the given data from the market. And the idea is now here, take randomized signature, map it to some RK, and then learn W. And actually, the whole information of the dynamics actually is in this matrix here, W. And if you now want to uh, simulate into the future, you make a little model for M. And then... Yes, I'm finished. I'm finished. It's uh, 10 seconds. Yeah. And uh, this allows you to have uh, to make use of this model. 
I do not want to uh, to stress my my chairman who has been very kind with me further. There are of course many applications of this type of analysis. I just want to point out uh, uh, point attention on my co-authors. So there is uh, Akil Dirim, uh, uh, Erdin Akil Dirim from uh, ETH and Xiang Tzu. They are both working in my working group, and we do portfolio selection by random signature methods. Then there's this discrete time random signature uh, technology in the work which I showed the theorem before. And of course, I have to be very grateful to all the work done by the group in Oxford by Terry Lyons. This is um, uh, what I uh, uh, quote here at, at the end of this uh, uh, references. Thanks again for the attention and I give back to my chairman. Good. Well, thanks very much. Uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, yes. uh, sorry, it was a little bit too long. If this was a live if conference, we could have a round of applause at this stage. <laughs> we'll consider that done. Consider that done. Um, um, we have time for one or two questions. I'm just looking at the uh, chat session where the questions are logged, but I don't see any questions logged at the moment. Maybe some will come through in the next uh, minute or so. Uh, we had one a rather general question. I mean, when it comes to applications of finance, of course, a problem like pricing of exotics, you know, parametrically or otherwise, I mean, in some sense, we already know how to do that. Uh, I mean, in the sense that one could always improve it and come up with new ideas, but it's it's not uh, it's not what you would call a fundamental problem. And and besides, people have sort of lost interest in the problem of pricing exotic options. But uh, from a sort of slightly higher level perspective, I mean, which way are we going in this subject with finance? I mean, uh, I I don't pretend to any expertise in it myself, so I'm really asking you. It is uh, it is here not about uh, pricing exotic options. It's rather representing uh, path space functional of a general nature by linear combinations of universal functionals on path space, which allows to, for instance, control systems where the control will depend on the past of the system in a way which reduces it to a regression problem. So it is uh, a generic way how to reduce a lot of nonlinear problems, which you can come up in stochastic games, in stochastic optimization, uh, to regressing over a certain intelligently chosen basis. And the point here is that this basis has some random features. So in um, and that this is actually a very canonical way how to work with it. So the important thing is not so much about uh, pricing of exotics, it's rather about representing all sorts of functions on path space by a universally given regression basis. Well, very good. I think that answers it uh, quite clearly. Uh, I have a question coming from uh, Georgia Zubelli, who asks, uh, do you envisage, envisage uh, that uh, this approach could allow for example resampling and uh, bootstrapping? I mean, in a way, the procedure which I presented at the end is uh, that you only have one trajectory and you have really few econometric assumptions on how the, the market, uh, which dynamics you have, and you can come up with a regression methodology to fit a nonlinear econometric model of high dimension. Of course, this does not solve the problem that the drift is in principle unmeasurable, but up to the drift, you actually get a very cheap way how to write down uh, high dimensional uh, uh, econometric model. And if you combine that with some uh, bootstrapping technologies, this might be interesting high dimensional uh, uh, models for uh, for uh, price or all sorts of uh, uh, information you have in uh, in the market. Okay, well, thanks very much. And I think perhaps we can draw 
uh, this particular talk to a conclusion. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks a lot. Uh,